I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like you know grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there and you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects? Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Matt Bernico. I teach at Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois. And, uh, oh wait, who are you, Dean? <laughs> uh, I'm Dean Detloff. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto. Back to you, Matt. Nice, thanks. Good sign-off. <laughs> uh, this week on the Magnificast, we're taking a dive into Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Freire was a Brazilian philosopher, pedagogue, Marxist, and also a Christian. All of those things at once. Good stuff. His book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, is about a philosophy of education that helps educators think through their role in the liberation of the oppressed. Basically, Freire thinks that education should help individuals gain their liberation and turn back their alienation from their own humanity. In this episode, we're going to get down into some of the big ideas in Freire's work and figure out what this all might mean for us. There's a, a lot going on, so we're going to go through it kind of fast. Uh, maybe we should say first also that, I mean, this book is like especially relevant for us because Matt is a teacher, and maybe one day I'll be a teacher. We'll see uh, if anybody hires me at some point, but um, it is relevant beyond like just education, so... If you're turned off by the uh, pedagogy stuff right up front, don't worry. Uh, it'll it'll get wild. The book gets very wild. <laughs> uh, it's just like Foucault says, everything is uh, both a prison and a school all at once. <laughs> so just think about it like that. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe we should start out just saying uh, really quickly, Matt, uh, what is it like to read this book as somebody who works as an educator right now? Uh, pretty wild, actually. This book is cool because it's like um, it gives me lots of interesting ideas to think about in my own sort of pedagogical life. At the same time, it's so hard to imagine doing these things because of the ways that I think students in general, like how their expectations have been completely shaped by uh, both like United States individualism, capitalism and everything else. It's just like a really wild description of what education could be. And that's pretty fun. Yeah. And obviously, it's written in a very different context than like uh, American or Canadian educational systems. So that makes a pretty huge difference. Yeah, totally. Um, I guess we should say something about that. So <laughs> the context in which the book is written, uh, Freire is Brazilian, and he was um, he did educate in university settings, but he was also trying really hard to educate peasants and people who were illiterate or uh, in regions that had very low literacy rates and. He felt that education was a sort of necessary liberative practice uh, and would draw people into a, a liberating project um, and sort of tried to theorize all of that in this book. So it comes out of some kind of theoretical work, but I think a little more importantly, his work with uh, actual peasants and actual sort of organizing efforts. So um, that's a pretty big world of difference between where both Matt and I are located, I think. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, I think that's right on. At the same time, um, I mean, it is completely, you know, written from different contexts and written kind of bouncing off of the work he's done in peasant communities. It's a really cool thing to read, too, though, because you always hear of, I mean, like, you know, after every after every leftist revolution in the history of the world, right, the first thing they try to do is teach everybody how to read. Like, you know, that's right. what happened in the Soviet Union and what happened in Cuba and so on. And um, the question I always ask myself is like, okay, um, if that's the case, like, there must be some type of, like, pedagogical theory that's unique to like you know socialists and communists but like you never really hear about what that is and this is this is something mm -hmm. that kind of you can attest to that yeah that's right and it's neat because it takes a lot of assumptions that are embedded in other parts of communist theory and organizing 
and it tries to read them back into certain pedagogical habits, which is pretty neat. Like, uh, sometimes I get the impression reading certain communists, even like Lenin and others, that um, it's not that they don't think very hard about things like education by any means, or, you know, they write quite a bit about it. Um, but at the same time, sometimes I get the impression they kind of just internalize certain habits from like European enlightenment thinkers. And they're like, yep, that's just how we ought to do it. Like mm-hmm. one way or another. Um, and Frere, I think does a more interesting thing by trying to look at, uh, what kind of implicit theories are driving revolutionary movements and how do those actually change the way that we think about education structurally? Yeah, totally. This goes way beyond just like teaching people how to read. Yeah. Yeah. All right, before we jump in, I'll say one kind of cool anecdote, I think, anyway. Um, So I go to this weird school, the Institute for Christian Studies, and it is not a Marxist school, but we read Marxists here, and that's the context where I first read this book um, in a class on theories of education. And it's pretty cool because the school that I go to uh, is, I mean, it's a weird school. It's really interesting for a lot of reasons. Uh, It's kind of like freestanding. It's not tied to a particular university or to undergraduates. Um, But they have tried to internalize certain habits from Frere. Uh, One of them is um, kind of an interesting way of relating to teachers and students. So in most places, there's like professors and and pupils or students. Uh, But here we call people uh, in those roles uh, senior members and junior members, which is pretty neat. Um, So basically the idea is they're they're trying to sort of flatten a certain hierarchical relationship while also recognizing that some people have been doing it a lot longer than other people and, you know, they kind of like deserve your respect (laughs) in a certain way. Um, And that's a really neat thing. It does change our educational relationship, I think, uh, compared to other schools that I've been to and have learned at. Um, and another neat thing is uh, junior members have a, a say at every institutional level. Um, so every single thing that like affects us and all the committees and everything, uh, it's like a requirement that there's a junior member voice um, in those conversations that is like just as valid and legitimate. So there's a kind of transparency there. But anyway, uh, you know, we're not, like I said, not churning out uh, Marxist peasant organizers here, but it's kind of a neat um, principle that does really change the shape of the institution. Yeah, totally. I mean, I don't want to like uh, give anyone a peek behind the curtain of academia too much, but uh, if you go to college right now and you don't go to ICS, you're probably like <laughs> the the internal hierarchy of faculty making decisions for you is vast and you don't even know about it, but it's all there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. Um So yeah, I don't know. Well, we can get into it here, but I guess that's like kind of a a plug for a place that I really value and appreciate and uh, also a genuinely neat thing that we've been able to glean, I think, from reading Ferreira together as a faculty and and staff and students. Um, So yeah, let's dive right in. Uh, Before we go into the theoretical bit, there's a really cool part uh, right in the beginning of the book that is particularly relevant for our podcast, I think. Um, And I'll just read it. So commenting on, you know, what's about to follow, Frere writes, This admittedly tentative work is for radicals. He says, I'm certain that Christians and Marxists, though they may disagree with me in part or in whole, will continue reading to the end. But the reader who dogmatically assumes closed, irrational positions will reject the dialogue I hope this book will open. Uh, So many really kind of interesting rhetorical moves there, because Christians and Marxists are specifically the people he doesn't think are dogmatically... um, sort of closed or you know uh have these kind of irrational positions i think that's a really kind of provocative thing to say uh but the other is just to draw these two groups together and say those are the two groups that are gonna you know feel compelled to follow it through so i'll ask you matt why do you think that those two groups would want to read to the end of this book even if they disagree with this or that part yeah well i think christians might be like hmm why is this guy quoting uh fidel and che guevara and mao so much and marxists might be like why is this guy keep quoting the pope (laughs) right uh but for us uh it works out really well because we like all those people it's great (laughs) yeah uh we did read it to the end um he's not wrong yeah yeah. it's true (laughs) it's wild that we haven't read this before this is like this is a book that so perfectly sits at the intersections of both christianity and marxism and kind of like i think the best of both of them in some cases at least Mm -hmm. um yeah it's a really good demonstration of how to do that yeah i think so so even if you're not interested in pedagogy but you do like christianity and marxism this book has a lot to say to you yeah uh i guess we probably should have had somebody who's like an expert or something on here like even Derek ford has written a ton about ferrera a longtime guest of the show Derek ford uh and actually people should go check that out um 
But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a really readable book, so we don't need your help, Derek. Sorry. <laughs> we need to come up with a new title for Derek because he's been on the show so many times. Magnificast, <laughs> yeah. Magnificast Premium Guest Derek Ford. Yeah, that's right. Uh, some kind of chairman title. I'll have to think about yeah. it. Yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, let's dive in here. Um, let's start off with just a really standard binary that functions throughout this whole book. Uh, that between the oppressor and the oppressed. Um, so the book's called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, and this is the the basic super simple premise that um, this is a real binary in the world between oppressor and oppressed. And there's a lot of things that happen as a result of that binary. And Ferreira thinks education is one way that we can try to overcome that binary and build a, a different kind of world that doesn't have that binary. Um, so there's a lot that we can go into here. Uh, there's a, a kind of real humanism, I think, that motivates this, uh, this like rejection of that binary. Um, but I want to, sorry to put you on the spot again here, Matt, throw it to you and just see, um, how does that binary kind of fit for you throughout this book as a thematic, like organizing principle? Yeah. So the, the binary of oppressor and oppressed for Ferrari has to do with like humanization and how, and like, you know, like you just said, like a, um, a type of assumed humanism that's in his book that he does get into some philosophical trouble with this. And we can maybe talk about humanism as kind of a problem. We've done that. I think uh, on a past episode too, but anyways, um, the oppressor and oppressed uh, ends up being about like the dehumanization of people. Uh, So here's a quote from Freire about that thing. Uh, So he says dehumanization, which marks not only those whose humanity has been stolen, but also though in a different way, those who have stolen it. It's a distortion of the vocation of becoming more fully human. Okay, so in this way, the oppressor and oppressed dichotomy has to do with like the ways that um, people themselves become dehumanized. So like, you know, the oppressed are people who, whose humanity has been stolen in one way or another. He goes on to say later, that's through like the um, all, all kinds of different like oppressions, but he talks specific about labor. Um, but also the oppressed, the people that you usually think as being on top, the people who, you know, are the people in control of the situation, they're also in a way dehumanized because they've taken away someone else's humanity, right? So it's like both people, uh, both the oppressor and the oppressed, uh, both are like dehumanized in a in a unique way. Right. And uh, I think what's really interesting about this too, um, problems with humanism aside, is that for Ferreira, to become human is exactly to overcome these situations of oppression. Like, you can't really be fully human without that. Um, and so, like, he'll say, for example, uh, the struggle for humanization, for the emancipation of labor, for the overcoming of alienation, for the affirmation of men and women as persons uh, would be meaningless. This struggle is possible only because dehumanization, although a concrete historical fact, is not a given destiny but the result of an unjust order that engenders violence in the oppressors, which in turn dehumanizes the oppressed. Um, So I think what's really fascinating about that is that like uh, the ability to become human is still present, no matter how dehumanized uh, in his language, a situation might seem Um, like there's always kind of room to like keep moving toward that humanized principle. Uh, And then secondly, that all those things that he says in the beginning of that quote are conflated, like humanization, emancipation of labor, overcoming of alienation, affirmation of men and women as persons. um, Those are all like part of the same sort of synonymous uh, goal. Um, So that's kind of uh, a cool rhetorical move anyway, that like to be human is to be all those things, emancipated, free, not alienated, etc. I think it's at this point in this like type of rhetoric and the logic that he's setting up here that you see the ways that... For him, like the the politics and sort of um, like metaphysical undergirding of Marxism ties in so well with his type of Christianity um, in that, like, um, first of all, it gets worked out in a dialectic. And that's, you know, extremely Marxist. <laughs> and and secondly, yeah. though, is that like it's um, the problem of oppressor and oppressed is, is a result of an unjust order that could like be fixed. Right. There's like sort of a hope. Right. And like a. Uh, a more just society that was structured in just a different way. Right. Um, Well, on that point, I think that um, that, that like particular sort of Christian Marxist strand that's like in here comes out even better in this next part that comes right after Freire says, in order for this struggle to have meaning, the oppressed must not in seeking to regain their humanity, which is a way to create it become in turn oppressors of the oppressors, but rather restorers of the humanity in both. 
So, um, I mean, off of these two points, I think you can see the sort of like the quintessential Christian slash Marxist move that we've read in so many people so far. Like this is in Herbert McCabe. This is in uh, the Fidel and Religion book that we read. Um, I think that this is something that maybe sets apart um, Christians and like actual just like non-religious, non-religious Marxists in the sense that like Christian Marxists always have this tendency to um, believe that even like, you know, everyone can kind of be saved in the end, which is a nice thought, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, to recognize that that everyone being saved also doesn't mean um, pretending that you should be polite when you shouldn't. Yeah. Or like uh, pretending that like the oppressors and the oppressed are on some, somehow like the same plane and they deserve the same kind of like respect or, uh, you know, deference. Like that's not what they're saying. Uh, instead, they're saying that like, there's a there's a sort of moral like sickness that is present in the oppressor that can only be uh, cured by removing the you know that kind of like wound or like the environment that makes you sick or something like that. Um, it's like cleaning up all that black mold in your apartment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna run with that metaphor, but I almost did. It's like fixing your uh, house. I, it's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like the man um, yeah, who built metaphor, his but... house on the rock instead of the shifting sands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's exactly like that. Um, but I guess uh, the point is just to say that um, in trying to see the oppressor as like a, a possible, um, you know, subject of redemption or something like that, it doesn't mean that like you should just like be nice to oppressors or, you know, always hold out hope that they'll just like repent and change or something. Uh, but it's actually a weird kind of motivation to actually struggle against them in a certain respect. Well, it's just like hate the sin, love the sinner, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. That's <laughs> actually bad, but it's kind of the same. It's like sort of a, a similar <laughs> set kind of idea, right? <laughs> like the, there's an idea that they could be saved or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and that salvation may actually look different, right? Like salvation for the oppressor means actually removing the privileges that make them oppressors, whereas salvation for the oppressed means, uh, m you know, removing the situation that d that deprivileges or disadvantages them. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, well, we are dangerously close talking about soteriology, so let's go to something different really <laughs> quick before like anyone yeah. on Twitter would be mad at us because we... Uh, I'm specifically worried about uh, Jonathan Murden. Uh, I can just... I can already sense him being very upset. He's so. like the Magnificat. Shout out to you, Jonathan. Yeah, he's like the Magnificat watchdog. Like whenever we say something about theology <laughs> and it's wrong, he will let us know. Well, he's just someone who actually knows what he's talking about. Exactly. So. Yeah. Well, anyways, <laughs> at the at sort of the end of the first section of Pedagogy of the Press, uh, Freire jumps in and gives us a nice like uh, encapsulation of like what the problem in the book is he's going to tackle. So the central problem that Freire is after is this. How can the oppressed, as divided, unauthentic beings, participate in developing the pedagogy of their liberation? Only as they discover themselves to be the host of the oppressor can they contribute to the midwifery of their liberating pedagogy. As long as they live in the duality in which to be is to be like, and to be like is to be like the oppressor, this contribution is impossible. So, that's pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> there's right. a lot of good there's a lot of good rhetoric in there first of all let me just say that uh midwifery of their liberating pedagogy is extremely good but anyways the <laughs> the question is one that i think um i mean the, the question that ferrari raises here is the one that like um that every post-marxist philosopher ends up raising in one way or another is like um right well like i mean like why why do the masses desire fascism is like one way of putting it or just like why don't people revolt is another way of putting it right it's just like how can people who are in these situations of oppression um be sort of instrumental in their own liberation right right and not only that how can they exercise the like demon of the oppressor that is sort of stuck within them yeah exactly uh and that's the theme that comes up over and over in this book too right is that um it's not enough to just like give someone the right answer or something like that and like program them differently uh it's like well everybody kind of has inherited this uh ambiguous identity where you're like part oppressor and part oppressed um and both revolutionary leaders and uh, revolutionary masses have to like deal with that yeah exactly um well it's a good book and it's a good question so i guess we can figure out how he answers <laughs> it now yeah for sure um so there's a ton of stuff involved in education, but I think uh, probably if I could think of one um, ultimate theme of this book, it would actually be just like the word with. I think that that word just appears over and over and over again. Hmm. 
and uh, he opposes with to a lot of other things. So it's like you should be educating with the masses, uh, with the oppressed, rather than educating for them or um, the education of them or something like that. Mm. Um, and that kind of with language uh, it keeps pulling all these vertical relationships down into horizontal relationships. So like revolutionary leaders don't lead the masses. They lead with the masses. Um, you know, all these kinds of things happen uh, with distinctions inside of them or whatever, uh, but they happen on like the same plane. Um, so that like preposition, I guess, is just a theme that comes through this book a lot. Yeah, that's a good observation. Um, I like that. Uh, I learned it at ICS, so <laughs> thanks to them. That's good. <laughs> um, yo, if you've been following me on Twitter, you know that I've been in this really wild uh, leadership class that I've been taking for this. Right. <laughs> it's a whole thing. If you don't know about it, it's fine. Just just know that I've been in this weird <laughs> class that's been about leadership. And um, we had this like really like stupid textbook. And it's just like, your leaders lead in these ways. And it's always kind of hovering over <laughs> the people they lead. And I love this book because it's like exactly the opposite. So... <laughs> Can't wait to get into some uh, online discussion board uh, wars with people about this. Yeah, that'll be good. Um, well, uh, one cool thing is that Freire goes out of his way to enumerate a series of uh, bad and good habits that contribute to like genuinely good horizontal withing leadership, if you want to put it that way, or like pedagogical relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and we should get to those in just a second. Um, but before we do, maybe we should talk about uh, the kind of um, conceptual dichotomy between what Ferrer calls banking education and dialogical education. I think that's a really fun way of putting it. Yeah, so banking education is pretty straightforward. That's probably the way that you were taught in school. Uh, like you show up to your classroom and you wait for your teacher to put all the good ideas in your head. <laughs> you got to make uh, deposits in that account. Yeah, I mean, and uh, make make withdrawals at the testing time. Your head is the piggy bank to your teacher's good idea quarters. Yeah, I mean, he like I think there's a sentence that's basically like that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm not that far away. I don't have a quote in front of me, but I think it is that. Um, yeah, but I mean, like you know, it's like the worst type of teaching. Like somebody somebody reads you a PowerPoint for 40 minutes, and then you take a test showing that you were able to memorize the you know the PowerPoint, and then you're done, and you and you've won the class. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, you uh, graduate with interest. Um, and the the opposite side, uh, the, the kind of pedagogical model that Freire wants to talk about is a dialogical model. Um, so and, and also not just dialogical, but problem posing, he says. So the idea is that instead of uh, just, you know, making these deposits, information deposits, you should actually pose problems to uh, to people that you're teaching and allow them to dialogically with you work out an answer. And the idea, too, is that the the pedagogue, the teacher, also doesn't necessarily have a pre-programmed answer. Um, the idea is that you're all supposed to be sort of on this uh, path together where you're posing fundamental questions about what it means to be a person in the world. Um, he gives a number of examples. Uh, one example I remember him giving, uh, and this comes from his own teaching experience, is he's teaching these peasants, and they see somebody who is super drunk, and uh, they start talking about it. And Frere is like, okay, well, why is that person drunk? And what are the conditions that make somebody want to get drunk? And slowly, the peasants kind of just, you know, talk amongst themselves and with Frere together. And they come to the conclusion that, like, there's a lot of material reasons to get drunk. Maybe you don't make a good wage. Maybe you get abused by your boss. Maybe you have, like, a really bad uh, living situation. Um, and so it, he talks about how that, you know, changes the complete perception of these people of their world and the people who live in it. Um, so all of a sudden, this person who just before that process was, you know, a drunk, uh, now this person is another sort of oppressed person uh, who might be invited, you know, to be sort of a, a liberator with. Um, so that's the kind of model that he's after, this problem posing dialogical model. Uh, so to get there, he tries to identify a series of what he calls anti-dialogical um, habits or, or tendencies, and then he kind of counterposes them with the dialogical uh, difference. So this is a very like dialectical way of thinking, um, but that's how he does it. Uh, so I don't know, Matt, do you think we should just jump right in there? Any other, uh, prefatory remarks? No, let's just get into it. This this is the best (laughs) part of the book to me. I mean, there's like three other chapters that, that precede it, but this is the best part. Yeah, totally. Um, all right. First anti-dialogical habit is conquest. Uh, so I'm going to read a short kind of description 
that Freire gives. So he says, the anti-dialogical individual in their relations with others aims at conquering them increasingly and by every means from the toughest to the most refined, from the most repressive to the most solicitous paternalism. Um, I mean, it seems kind of straightforward, but in fact, I think it's a little more complicated because Freire is also trying to root out not just the pedagogy that happens among, uh, you know, bourgeois, like banking teachers or whatever, uh, but also like bad tendencies that undermine or subvert revolutionary projects. Um, and so that drive to conquest is one thing that he identifies in like revolutionary leaders that trips them up. Um, so it's kind of like a thing that, okay, say somebody decides one day, Hey, I, you know, I'm going to be a revolutionary. I like agree with all this stuff now. And they're kind of coming down from the mountain to educate the oppressed. Um, Frere is like, well, like, hold on a second, because you're probably coming with like a ton of assumptions, um, and a ton of like internalized oppressive, uh, habits and conquests, he says is one of them. One that subverts the dialogical method that he's after. He does have this whole bit at the beginning of the book too, like taking a step back, I guess even though we just tried not to do that um, <laughs> where, where he talks about there is like this, um, this exact um, type of like, I don't know, maybe seduction with some type of revolutionary characters where he says like, you know, a lot of times is what happens sort of post revolutions is that um, the, uh, the leaders of revolutionary movements will end up making the same mistakes that the oppressors did. Right. And then they'll end up as the oppressors of the oppressed. And like, that's not the point, right? It's not liberating enough. Um, so right. yeah, uh, it's, it's it's wild because the I mean like it just kind of demonstrates that when he's talking when Freire is talking about um, pedagogy he means it in like this very big sense right not just school but pedagogy and all places of life like the places where we learn different types of habits or different ways of thinking like you know political parties are pedagogical and churches are pedagogical in all of these ways so kind of interesting right and the oppressed don't uh, just learn in schools obviously right. Uh-huh. That wouldn't be the place that you would probably go to find the oppressed. Right, exactly. Uh, all right, so conquest. That's a bad one. Number one, conquest, anti-dialogical habit. <laughs> what uh, What's counterposed to that, Matt? Yeah, the solution to conquest is cooperation. It's a good one. <laughs> um, so he has a lot to say about cooperation that I think is really interesting, and he ends up using an extremely Christian word to um, get to the bottom of it. But um, I think that cooperation um, and with regards to sort of like revolutionary movements and revolutionary leaders, uh, he kind of tells a story. Maybe you can think of it as a little bit of a case exa- uh, case study, a case example. Um, so Freire says uh, Fidel Castro and his comrades, um, our, our dude for sure, uh, Fidel Castro and his comrades, who many at the time termed irresponsible adventurers. I like that uh, phrase. An eminently dialogical (laughs) leadership group identified with the people who endured the brutal violence of the Batista dictatorship. The adherence was not easy. It required bravery on the part of the leaders to love the people sufficiently to be willing to sacrifice themselves for them. It required courageous witness by the leaders to recommence after each disaster, moved by undying hope and future victory, which, because forged together with the people, would belong not only to the leaders alone, but to the leaders and the people, or to the people including the leaders." Um, so cooperation we see here in this like specific example is a, is um, okay not just about sort of like the revolutionary love that some people like you know Castro Guevara might have for like the people of Cuba or something, but it's also like about a, a certain positionality of those leaders to the people, and I think that's sort of mm-hmm. the important thing to start drawing out here. Um, not just like the leaders and the people, but the people including the leaders, right, putting them first or something. Um, mm-hmm. I want to read the next part too because it's really cool. So sorry you don't get to read Spadine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so even going on a little bit more on this part of cooperation, Ferrari says, uh, in dialogical theory, at no stage can revolutionary action forego communion with the people. Communion, in turn, elicits cooperation, which brings leaders and people to the fusion described by Guevara. This fusion can exist only if revolutionary action is really human, empathetic, loving, communicative, and humble in order to be liberating. The revolution loves and creates life, and in order to create life, it may be obliged to prevent some men from circumscribing life. In addition to the life-death cycle basic to human nature, there is almost an unnatural living death, life which is denied its fullest. Okay, so I just read a lot, and we can probably talk about it for a minute or two. But it really forces the idea that there's like a connection between revolutionary leaders and their people that goes far beyond just like 
you know, a like or an opportunism or just trying to get them on your side or something, right? There's like a real sense of identification with, cooperation with. The word communion is a big deal for Christians for some real specific reasons. Um, I don't know, Dean, what do you make of all this part? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good thing to point out. Um, And to detect that internalization of Christian themes too, I think is really good. I mean, we've been talking a lot about like the Marxist stuff, but uh, if you're a Christian and you know how to read between the lines, like you won't be surprised to find a lot of Christian terminology. Um, He like wears it pretty lightly a lot of the time, but it's definitely there. Um, I think what's really wild to me about this is so many of these uh, adjectives that he uses are things that could be present definitely in like the McCabe essay, the class struggle in Christian love. Yeah. Um, so he says like this fusion can only exist if revolutionary action is human, empathetic, loving, communicative, and humble. Like, uh, it reminds me of that part where McCabe says, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is really good because it helps uh, people learn how to be better comrades to each mm-hmm. other. Um, like those are the kinds of people that you want in a revolutionary movement, uh, people you can rely on to, uh, care about you. I think that's really cool. Yeah, totally. Um, in one of my classes, uh, this past week, we were talking a little bit about the Cuban revolution and, um, and Guevara's radio station. That was like, it's, that's the point of the class. Right. But uh, we were uh, talking a little bit of uh, Regis Debray's book, The Revolution and the Revolution. And uh, he has this whole section in it that's kind of interesting about armed propaganda and the ways that like a huge point, like a huge um, like duty of uh, parts of the, yeah, of Guevara's com- column in Cuba was just to go visit the like peasants and try to like help them. Um, right. So like if you've seen even, the recent uh biopic about shay's life um there's a scene where he goes and like pulls this like parasite out of like a little kid's eye and like the the peasants at the farm start like really like being into them and stuff right so i mean debray kind of like undersells it as like this is all about just like propaganda but i think that uh paulo Freire gets it right where it's more than just like you know they're, they're not just going to these people because they want them to be on their side they're going to these people because like they are they're their people, right? They're the people of Cuba that are living mm-hmm. under this type of oppression. So, um, yeah, there's something going on here that's more than just um, propaganda or opportunism. It's like a real type of revolutionary love. Yeah, yeah. And it's great that he roots it in like an identifiable example. It's not just theoretical. Mm-hmm. Um, All right, let's talk about the next pairing. So uh, number two anti-dialogical principle is divide and rule. Um, and I think this one's really interesting because there's also another subtle kind of Christian thing in here, but it's actually a a critical thing. Um, so I'll read like first kind of like maybe a chunk of paragraph about, uh, divide and rule and then, uh, move into the, the like weird Christian thing. Uh, so Ferrer writes explaining it, uh, as the oppressor minority subordinates and dominates the majority, it must divide it and keep it divided in order to remain in power. The minority cannot permit itself the luxury of tolerating the unification of the people, which would undoubtedly signify a serious threat to their own hegemony. Accordingly, the oppressors halt by any method, including violence, any action which in even incipient fashion could awaken the oppressed to the need for unity. Concepts such as unity, organization, and struggle are immediately labeled as dangerous. In fact, of course, these concepts are dangerous to the oppressors, for their realization is necessary to actions of liberation. So that's a summary of the point, anyway. Um, we can talk about that for a minute and then I'll go on to the, the Christian bit. Uh, what do you think about this divine rule uh, and how Ferrer describes it, Matt? Yeah, sounds right on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is uh, right on. This harkens to all kinds of types of things we might that might fall under sort of a liberal identity politics. Like, you know, um, we can see sort of lots of historical examples where um, white supremacists have tried to keep, um, you know, uh, black Americans, the United States from organizing with like, you know, communist parties and other, other places like that too. Um, keeping people separated, uh, is exactly a way to sort of keep control. It's a way to like reinforce that type of conquest over and over again. Right. Uh, and even like pretending, um, that they're not doing that, uh, but instead doing it with methods, even like violence, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Important to point out that it's not important to do. Uh, (laughs) Correct. Um, all right. So uh, here's the here's the kind of Christian bit I wanted to flag. So um, this talks about uh, class conflict in particular. So Ferrer writes, Cla- class conflict is another concept which upsets the oppressors since they do not wish to consider themselves an oppressive class. 
unable to deny, try as they may, the existence of social classes, they preach the need for understanding and harmony between those who buy and those who are obliged to sell their labor. However, the unconcealable antagonism which exists between the two classes makes this harmony impossible. The elites call for harmony between classes as if classes were fortuitous agglomerations of individuals curiously looking at a shop window on a Sunday afternoon. The only harmony which is viable and demonstrable is that found among the oppressors themselves. Uh, so if you're a Catholic and you're familiar with Catholic social teaching, uh, words like harmony and class harmony and being upset about class conflict will immediately bring to mind uh, the encyclical Rerum Novarum, a uh, pretty famous labor encyclical by Pope Leo the Thirteenth from the 19th century. Um, and here is some pretty wild stuff that Pope Leo says. Um, so he writes this. The great mistake in regard to the matter now under consideration is to take up with the notion that class is naturally hostile to class and that the wealthy and the working men are intended by nature to live in mutual conflict. So irrational and so false is this view that the direct contrary is the truth. Just as the symmetry of the human frame is the result of the suitable arrangement of the different parts of the body, so in a state is it ordained by nature that these two classes should dwell in harmony and agreement so as to maintain the balance of the body politic. Each needs the other. Capital cannot do without labor, nor labor without capital. Mutual agreement results in the beauty of good order, while perpetual conflict necessarily produces confusion and savage barbarity. Now, in preventing such strife as this and in uprooting it, the efficacy of Christian institutions is marvelous and manifold. First of all, there's no intermediary more powerful than religion, whereof the church is the interpreter and guardian, in drawing the rich and the working class together by reminding each of its duties to the other and especially to the obligations of justice. All right, so this paragraph pissing me off so much <laughs> for so many reasons. It drives me absolutely bonkers and up the wall. And uh, I love that Freyra just has like an extremely subtle uh, just own for this whole paragraph where he's like, ah, sorry, actually that's bullshit. Anyway, moving on. Like doesn't even feel the need to like refute it line by line. It's just kind of like, uh, look around you, dude. Like don't make the church into a... Uh, you know, basically like an instrument for pretending that there's no such thing as class conflict. Uh, like, it's crazy that Pope Leo is basically like, listen, the church exists for counter-revolutionary aims. I don't know what you want. <laughs> like, it's uh, it's so bad. Right. Um, yeah, man, uh, not being Catholic, this doesn't really affect me in any way, but it is extremely, <laughs> it's such a bad take, right? Um, I love that, like, uh, <laughs> uh, the notion that class is naturally hostile to class is like kind of like a, uh, it's just like some kind of myth. Uh, says <laughs> like like how how like crazy and untrue is that in a time where like millionaires and billionaires are destroying yeah. the entire world and like going to leave the planet um <laughs> like they, they yeah, were... or even in like the 19th century when pope leo was writing when like literally children were like dying in sweatshops yeah but like uh not hostile to one another at all right like I, I mean, the children need some place to go after school. I mean, go instead of school, and uh, you know, factory owners needed cheap labor. It makes sense. It's mutual. <laughs> Just told, like, yeah, completely sort of equivalent exchange right there. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, what's wild is like this encyclical is popular among progressive Catholics because it also talks about like rights of labor and like just wages and all that kind of stuff, and it like opens the door for you know being positive about unions and all that. But like it's couched in a theory that completely prevents any of that from being actually efficacious. So right. I don't know. Sorry, Dorothy day. Like you picked the wrong one. Like in Catholic social teaching, is this kind of like a, like an incremental change that is good or something, but is uh, that how people read it well, like sort of incrementally. This is better than what it used to be or something like that. If it's like, it's kind of the first real, like big and typical to deal with a uh, modern labor at all, which is kind of interesting anyway. Uh. Um, but I mean, it is absolutely a, like, it, it's definitely, it comes on the scene because of the threat of communism and socialism. Okay. Like it is intended to diffuse it for sure. Um, which is too bad. And like, it ends up tripping up a ton of people. And then by the time you get to somebody like Pope Francis, uh, he has to like bend over backwards to kind of be like, don't worry, I'm not like, uh, you know, ruining off Catholic social teaching. Um, you know, so it's really, it kind of hamstrings a, a more radical position, I think. What a way to diffuse the threat of communism by just being like, nah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nope, actually. The opposite. Yeah, exactly. For no reason. It's true. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So divide and rule. It's bad. And Pope Leo, sorry, you're also bad. Um, but unity for liberation. Uh, that is what uh, Paulo Freire says is the, the antidote to divide and rule. Um, so I was just talking a ton. So I'm going to throw it over to you. Yeah. Now. Love unity for liberation. One of my favorite things.
<laughs> Can't get enough of it. All right. So Paulo Freire says this. The praxis of oppression is easy, or at least not difficult, for the dominant elite. But it's not easy for the revolutionary leaders to carry out a liberating praxis. The former group can rely on using the instruments of power. The latter group has his power directed against it. The former group can organize itself freely, and though it may undergo fortuitous and momentary divisions, it unites rapidly in the face of any threat to its fundamental interests. The latter group cannot exist without the people, and this very condition constitutes the first obstacle to its efforts in organization. Okay, so this is a kind of a reframing of the question that we start the book off with, like how can people who are oppressed um, participate in their own liberation? The odds are kind of stacked against them, right? Um, so that is a pretty big deal. Um, so finding finding ways actually forward towards the unity of liberation is obviously um, completely dialogical in terms of uh, divide and rule. Um, bringing people together under sort of like a common banner is um, is obviously dialogical to dividing people. Right. And that, uh, yeah, exactly. The, the dialogical nature is what creates the unity as opposed to the, you know, just like banking uh, model of like education and society or something like that. Um, I love actually, here's a, here's a cool quote. Um, so for uh, talks a lot about how um, the dominating elite and the oppressor has to create like an enclosed mythical world um and then they just keep reproducing that world and so one antidote to that is like dialogical creativity mm -hmm. um and so here's a really neat paragraph uh that has to do with that so for writes in order for the oppressed to unite they must first cut the umbilical cord of magic and myth which binds them to the world of oppression the unity which links them to each other must be of a different nature to achieve this indispensable unity the revolutionary process must be from the beginning cultural action um i just think that's like a really neat point uh that like there is a kind of like perverse unity that's foisted on people who are oppressed um but you have to build like a different kind of unity right like a unity that doesn't rely on like the myth that's given to you or something like that like the, like the myth of class harmony yep that's exactly what's meant by class harmony i mean we, we hear it i hear it constantly even sort of in contemporary situations like my mom is always saying like man isn't it just a bummer that people are so polarized i wish we could just be like right one united american people it's like well right no but yeah it would be cool <laughs> if we were like you know if it was a real type of unity rather than like right. a, a type of like false grouping of people right um cool well not much more to say about that i guess it's pretty straightforward unity is better than division uh but like the right kind of unity yeah and uh and the right kind of division dividing against uh you know the oppressors um all right uh i'm also gonna give you this one to kind of introduce us matt because i know it's uh, one of your hobby horses right. uh <laughs> this one is this anti-dialogical behavior is manipulation yeah, I, uh what do you think about I'm that i'm so cranky about this one particularly <laughs> all right so at the beginning of every episode, I say that I teach media studies, and this will maybe make it stick out to you a little bit more. Uh, I think that manipulation gets a really bad rap, guys. Uh, this is just sort of like, okay, <laughs> picture me saying this, like with like my like professor jacket slung on my shoulder and like my leg propped up on a chair. So uh, let's rap, gang. Knee pads, bubble pipe. Yeah, exactly. Uh, manipulation gets a bad rap, y'all. Propaganda gets a bad rap. Uh, people think that propaganda and manipulation in the media are like such bad things all the time. People are always constantly going on about, man, fake news just lying to me. And like, you know, it's true. Fake news is bad or whatever. But uh, propaganda, manipulation, like are all types of advertising. <laughs> um, people don't have t people don't really have problems with advertising. Usually people are actually really into them a lot all the time in a capitalist society, especially. But if we think of promoting our causes as a type of advertising in terms of um of like good things right manipulation isn't so bad like you think of manipulation and you instantly get a bad picture in your mind of someone forcing you to believe something that's not true like some type of like you know weird uh type of like uh cold war propaganda or something but manipulation really just means like you know forming something forming a message so that people will want to listen to it okay so <laughs> All I'm trying to say here is that propaganda like promoting your own ideas especially when they're really good is actually not a bad thing all, all I'm trying to say, <laughs> maybe it's a hot take to say propaganda yeah. is not bad, but it's uh, it's good actually. Well, I like what you wrote about that in your uh, critical mediations um, blog post. 
So people should read that. I think it's really good. Yeah, for sure. Um, and even uh, Chairman Derek Ford agrees with me. So what can I say? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Derek wrote uh, a really great piece on propaganda for Liberation School a while back, and also on a good Hampton short Institute. essay on this book. Oh, that's right. Hampton Institute. Yeah. Um, yeah. He has done a lot of cool work with Fra also. Um, anyway. Uh, all right. True. Fair. Correct. But uh, let me throw this at you. What if what Fra means by manipulation uh, is more interesting than that? Yeah, um, it is. It's totally interesting. More interesting than that. So <laughs> well, let me get into it a little bit more here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if if when we read Frere, meaning when he... If we read Freire when he says manipulation as just like bad types of persuasion in media, then I guess it's fine. Like if he means by if what he means by manipulation is like capitalist manipulation, then yes, this what he says is probably true. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's a quote: <laughs> By means of manipulation, the dominant elites try to conform the masses to their objectives, and the greater the political immaturity of these people, rural or urban, the more easily the latter can be manipulated by those who do not wish to lose their power. Okay pretty straightforward just kind of like i I mean like there's nothing really scandalous about this at all right uh Mm -hmm. people who have uh power to do so the dominant elites they um try to adjust various groups of people to their own objectives that is like literally the definition of like what public relations is (laughs) um right and i agree with him um that the reason they do this is so that they don't lose their power and that sucks and it is bad. <laughs> but if they, uh, if right. like, you know, the people, whoever those people are, a revolutionary group, if they were to manipulate, um, you know, the people like r- rural or urban, it'd be fine. Yeah. Though. Uh, okay. So I'm, I kind of feel, I feel really ambivalent actually about how far talks here. Um, and here's a quote that maybe helps illustrate why. Uh, so for writes, when the oppressed are almost completely submerged in reality, it is unnecessary to manipulate them. In the anti-dialogical theory of action, manipulation is the response of the oppressor to the new concrete conditions of the historical process. Through manipulation, the dominant, elite, dominant elites can lead the people into an unauthentic type of organization and thus avoid the threatening alternative, the true organization of the emerged and emerging people. So, okay... On the one hand, like, I think he actually has kind of a point that, like, when people are uh, aware of the reality of their oppression, you kind of don't have to do a lot of work to explain that to them. <laughs> uh, like, you don't have to manipulate people, really, into being like, yeah, actually, like, capitalism is bad because they already know it, right? Um, like, if they knew it, you wouldn't have to manipulate them. But at the same time, like, I don't know, uh, as a person who has, like, slowly, very slowly had to, like, unlearn a lot of things, having been, been like, and still am, like, thoroughly immersed in an oppressor society, like, uh, I don't really mind, like, people trying to manipulate me, provided it's for the right reasons or something, uh, <laughs> like, like, going to see a movie like Sorry to Bother You, uh, really good manipulation, really want to get manipulated by that, for sure, um, but at the same time, like, I don't know, like, if you really knew a lot about capitalism and, like, racism, would it really have the same, like, affective force? Well, no, right? So, I, yeah, I guess I just feel kind of like, maybe I'm just, like, struggling to make heads or tails of how I think about it. Yeah, I actually think that quote that you said was really interesting. Um, when the oppressed are almost completely submerged in reality, like, okay, I'm not sure if the imp- if the impasse here is exactly what you said, right? Like, people just know their oppression. And I think that's true. I think that, like, you know, working people who are taking advantage of by capitalism are not, like, blind to how it's a bad deal for them. At the same time, though, like, they don't... They, they don't always recognize it in, right. like, one way or another. And even, like... But, but even, even in other examples, though, like every stupid academic in the entire world like they like you know who's ever read marx they like kind of know the theory they know what's going on there but they don't really like they're not really convicted by it in a way that like um is is any more than just like an academic exercise sorry other academics out there i guess and and even more so (laughs) that like i think that a lot of people i think that, that many of the oppressed here are not even submerged in reality but they're like submerged in like uh like hyper realities to i mean that's a complicated term because of philosophy but like (laughs) but you know what i mean like there's there's um there's a level of exposure to media that people are very confused about the world right 
And and it's true too that like saying that the oppressed are completely submerged in reality or could be is also kind of philosophically and unsophisticated. Like there's no kind of unmediated relationship to reality. Yeah, um, I think so. And in that sense, yeah, like there will always be manipulations one way or another. Yeah, so that's like hermeneutics. It's like hermeneutics. Good. <laughs> I'm just saying that media. Uh, like, I feel like I'm I'm like giving people an unfair shake here, but I just feel like media is such a pervasive thing in our lives that it's inescapable, and reality is hard to get at. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right that this is it's it's dealt with in the same way that like humanism is dealt with throughout the book, which is like uh, it's a really good rhetorical device, but like not a very good philosophical platform. Yeah. Well, speaking of things I disagree with and that I'm cranky about, here's something that I agree with. <laughs> at the end of this bit on manipulation Freire says this the revolutionary leader should take advantage of the contradictions of manipulation by posing it as a problem to the oppressed with the objective of organizing them yep on board yeah that's a good one um <laughs> what what's okay it's a good one uh however <laughs> <laughs> taking advantage of the contradictions of manipulation by posing it to them as a problem is like convincing them, right? That's like doing manipulation. That's your, yeah. that's doing yeah, your yeah. own public relations. <laughs> so yeah, good. Totally. So just make a better advertising campaign. True public relations, people relations. People, <laughs> exactly. Worker relations. <laughs> it's it's actually just human resources. Okay, nah. <laughs> right. All right. So how? What is a? Uh, what is Freire do oh. to counterpose this anyway? Right. So the dialogic answer to manipulation is instead organization. That's good. That's a pretty good one. Um, he wraps back around to manipulation uh, in, in this section, too, in some pretty interesting and helpful ways. But, Dean, uh, what, what does he have to say about organization? Yeah, so uh, I think here the kind of with stuff comes back in. Um, and you also get some interesting stuff on authority. Um, because, like, you have to have a certain kind of authoritative presence, I guess. Uh, not authoritarian presence, but authoritative presence to uh like get anything done to to organize anything um so he writes this authentic authority is not affirmed as such by a mere transfer of power but through delegation or in sympathetic adherence uh shout out to bakunin i guess um if authority is merely transferred from one group to another or is imposed upon the majority it degenerates into authoritarianism authority can avoid conflict with freedom only if it is freedom become authority Hypertrophy of the one provokes ap- atrophy of the other. Just as authority cannot exist without freedom and vice versa, authoritarianism cannot exist without denying freedom, nor license without denying authority. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here, but it actually really makes me think a lot about Venezuela. Um, like, people have such a hard time understanding how like Venezuela Venezuela's constitution works, for example. Um, or like how Chavez and then later Maduro are trying to lead Venezuela, which is not to say they haven't like whatever made mistakes, whatever that's fine. But like they like Chavez got a massive, massive majority all the time. I mean, he got like deposed by a military coup and they still voted him back in. Uh, and then like Maduro, even now with like all the problems that are happening in Venezuela, is still getting majority votes. Um, and like Western journalists just can't understand what is going on. Uh, but I think that Ferreira does a kind of interesting job articulating it. Like, it's through organization, uh, you know, having organized Venezuela's uh, poor so, like, intentionally through Chavismo, uh, that, like, authentic authority is the kind of thing that isn't just, like, affirmed through this, like, top-down transfer of power, but, like, people want to identify with the Bolivarian Revolution, and uh, this is, like, how they do it. So, I don't know, that's just, like, one kind of thing that... Um, kind of came up for me and it's interesting because like western media paints that situation as like a a, you know vast manipulative strategy or whatever when it's actually kind of more the result i think of organization yeah i think so i think this is actually the best take about democratic socialism um the the freedom become authority thing i mean not the democratic socialism like in the dsa but like democratic socialism in the sort of political philosophy sense um Right, right. That that it's it's that um that authority is achieved through I guess like legitimate means, authentic means. People, um, like they recognize their freedom and they still say this person ought to be in charge. Hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, Freire just by his quotations comes out of a certain Leninist, and then Mao and sort of Fidel and Che get in there. Uh, but Leninist, uh, you know, trajectory. 
And I think democratic centralism is uh, in the background a little bit for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's another quote in this section that I really like too, and I'll go ahead and say it right now. Please do. <laughs> in the theory of dialogical action, organization requires authority, so it cannot be authoritarian. It requires freedom, so it cannot be licentious. Organization is, rather, a highly educational process in which leaders and the people together experience true authority and freedom, which they seek to establish in society by transforming the reality which mediates them. It's a pretty cool take. Again, it's it's, uh, really democratic. I mean, definitely within the uh, framework of democratic centralism in a good way. Um, I don't know what the bad way is of democratic centralism, but it's like good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I like that organization is uh, a highly educational process. It's like, um, I don't know, everyone's in it together, right? The, it really is sort right. of like a, 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 a true democracy in that sense. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I often think about this too when I think about, um, I don't know, relationships of authority. Like sometimes people just, I think especially living in places like America or Canada, which have this uh, real, you know, ideology of individualism to them, um, people get so bent out of shape about like, not having their absolute control on like every single minute decision that happens in their society. Uh, and I like cannot understand that position because like I would really, really like to just sort of like trust that things are going okay. And like, I don't really have to worry about it that much. <laughs> like it really sucks to be a voter in a capitalist society where you like are pressured to just understand every single thing that's happening because you can't really trust that the people in authority are like, probably being motivated in the right way or something like that uh like there's something really liberating in knowing that there's somebody that you trust you know kind of uh making certain decisions or like guiding people through a certain situation because they've like earned that uh because they're a good person or something because they exhibit those like comradely qualities that Freire identified earlier you know like love for the people and humility and all that kind of stuff so i don't know just a weird thing that comes to mind for me sometimes yeah well to me these ideas are so like they have so much to do with democracy, but in like ways that we don't really ever think yeah. about it. Like, like, like that individualistic type of like, man, I wish I could be in charge of every single decision. Like I want to vote on everything. So this direct democratic way, like I kind of, I kind of get the impulse because like, I guess I'm an American and I do have that sort of individualism in me, but usually that type of democracy leads to like, actually I just wish I was in charge. Um, yeah, exactly. Sort of a negative way, but but what you're describing, I think what Ferrari described is describing here too, is that like, what if representative democracy was actually representative? Um, yeah, yeah. And it's kind of a crazy idea because it's not like the representative democracy in the United States is is not at all. I mean, like people think that they are represented, but I mean, not really. Like, write your congressmen and see what they do. No, like nothing. Like they won't actually represent <laughs> yeah. your opinions, like because they don't really care about your opinions, right? They care about continuing their power and their hegemony over society. Um, so. Um, what but what's going on here is like you know um definitely a type of democratic centralism but a type of democracy that like envisions like well what if the people in charge should be in charge <laughs> right. crazy idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly uh all right let's go to the the final binary here um the binary if you will i will uh, thank you. the last <laughs> the last anti dialogical principle is uh cultural invasion And he actually has a a lot to say about this, uh, but he summarizes it pretty well, um, I think, anyway, in a few lines. So he writes, In this phenomenon, the invaders penetrate the cultural context of another group in disrespect to the latter's potentialities. They impose their own view of the world upon those they invade and inhibit the creativity of the invaded by curbing their expression. Uh, there's, uh, there are obvious ways in which oppressors do this, but I think the more interesting thing is to note that Frere actually suggests this is something that revolutionary leaders or would-be leaders actually get caught up in a mm. lot. Um, so in particular, he warns against like bourgeois people assuming leadership in revolutionary movements because he says that they often have a tendency to, to do this exact thing, like to impose a bourgeois culture on a non-bourgeois people. Um, you know, on the proletariat, uh, or even the, you know, the lumpen proletariat, like, uh, just like peasants or whatever. And, um, you know, he's trying to say that is exactly the kind of anti-dialogical, uh, impulse that will 
totally crush uh, any kind of real like egalitarian energy within revolutionary movements. Um, so I, I don't know. I think like it, it's like it's too obvious to point out that oppressors do this. Uh, and it's actually more important to consider the way in which revolutionaries do this or would be revolutionaries. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that first got a great point there. When I read this, though, I just immediately thought of like every time I've ever been in church and like, you know, a missionary is there speaking. <laughs> um yeah totally it's exactly that (laughs) it's exactly that like gotta convert those people yikes yeah and curb their own expression right yeah curb their own potential exactly instead of like sort of like thinking through the okay sorry uh i guess i'll get back on my soapbox um of things that i'm cranky about (laughs) last week at church there was like this missionary that was visiting and uh they were talking about how they were you know um out in the world to convert muslims and that really rubbed me the wrong way it's like instead of kind of thinking through the material situations that all of these conflicts arise in, there's like, well, must be the religion that's the fault. And like, mm-hmm. that's what they go for. And it's just like utterly depressing. <laughs> like, yeah. oh my God, stop. Yeah, exactly. It's cultural invasion for yeah, sure. Yeah, for real. Christians are good at it. Uh, and then uh, to kind of counterpose to that cultural invasion bit, there's a cultural synthesis that Ferrer proposes. And um, I'll read this real quick as well. Uh, so he says, In cultural invasion, both the spectators and the reality to be preserved are objects of the actor's action. In cultural synthesis, there are no spectators. The object of the actor's action is the reality to be transformed for the liberation of people. Cultural synthesis is thus a mode of action for confronting culture itself as the preserver of the very structures by which it was formed. Cultural action as historical action is an instrument for superseding the dominant alienated and alienating culture. In this sense, every authentic revolution is a cultural revolution. Mm. Uh, What do you think about that, Matt? I don't know, Dean. You you (laughs) tell me. I don't know what to think. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, I think the the broad point that Ferrer is trying to get at is to say that... um, liberation takes place on like societal wide scales uh and it i think really just keeps coming back to that withing point um that you have to do this with other people and to oppose a cultural uh cultural invasive attitude is to oppose something that tries to reproduce itself over and over and over again and it doesn't open itself up to creativity or difference Whereas uh, for Ferreira, I think this cultural synthesis point is to suggest that everyone should kind of feel empowered to um, to build an integrated society with one another um, instead of like, I don't know, imposing their own weird preferences on one group or, or another group. Uh, you're supposed to have this kind of, um, yeah, like uh, interlocking uh, revolution that doesn't just stop at like you know changing uh even who owns like what factories or whatever like for Freire, this uh revolutionary kind of energy should come down to the very way in which people understand themselves in relationship to each other in their world yeah totally actually this reminds me a lot i mean not that i know a ton of the situation but it does make me think a little bit of evo morales in um bolivia yeah so the, the sense that like you know all all of these i mean first of all he's like an indigenous person who is also a socialist so that's like a big deal um but, you know, there's like there's political recognition of a bunch of different um, indigenous cultures and they're not just kind of like painting over them towards some type of like, you know, <laughs> like um, monolithic sort of Bolivian and socialist society all at once. It's just like uh, they're, they're, they're working with what they have and not sort of erasing the past, but at the same time um, making things more economically just. Yeah, yeah. Or I was thinking of like the Zapatistas oh, throughout yeah. this entire book, but especially here. Um, you know, like, uh, I have this great book, uh, that includes a bunch of subcomandante Marcos, uh, like parables. He like read all these children's stories and, um, they're like very funny because, uh, a lot of them have to do with this like little, uh, beetle named Dorito and he's like running around, um, trying to like, he's like really tough and he wants to prove how tough he is as a Zapatista. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, like, very kind of, like, adorable. But he also is always asking people to, like, tell him stories, like, indigenous stories and stuff. And, uh, like, the impression you get is that Marcus is trying to write this uh, in such a way that, like, people will feel empowered to, like, tell these stories again and tell each other these stories and, like, ask each other stories. And, you know, I think there's just something about that. Uh, even the structure of the Zapatista uh, society in general um, kind of lends to this sort of cultural synthesis, right, that, like... Uh, you're not reproducing the structure of like coffee plantations you're trying to to build something different where like 
the way that women understand themselves is different. The way that like people's working lives uh, are are lived are, is different. Like all those kinds of things kind of have to come together at once. Yeah, totally. I mean, well, it's not explicitly Marxist. I mean, sometimes it is, but this is kind of uh, a part of like the various types of futurism and literature and art, like Afrofuturism or you know whatever. Um, mm-hmm. The ways that it like recasts a culture, uh, but without certain types of societal oppression. It's a a cool project. Yeah, totally. Uh, cool. Well, having uh, been Christians and Marxists who read this book to the very end, uh, maybe uh, the only people who listen to this podcast uh, and have gotten to the end here are also Christians and Marxists. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly um, right. That's the that's the sort of the overlap, the Venn diagram of this book and our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, let's see, how can we sign this off the best? Um, I guess. Uh, Okay, so this book has a lot to say about education. I think actually a lot of it is harder to transpose to like modern university settings than some of the secondary literature on this book suggests. Um, and I think it's actually interesting to kind of read this book for what it suggests about uh, like living our daily lives with each other and with other people. Um, like I really am impressed by the kind of work that Derek does with it. Uh, like he talks a lot about how like communist parties should be considered like pedagogical spaces where people learn about stuff. Uh, and that should like change the relationship of the party to like mass movements and to the people. Um, I think that's really good. Like, uh, even something as simple at like, as, uh, at ICS, you know, doing a kind of junior member, senior member terminological change, uh, it changes the, the culture of our learning institution, Um, So I think like for me, the takeaway of the book is like less, how does this work in like a classroom and more like, how does this can, how does this help us consider pedagogical relationships beyond like just the confines of like neoliberal education institutions? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. If you're a teacher and you're like looking for some like really radical pedagogy book, this is probably not the one for you. I mean, it is for you, but not in the way that you think it is. Like (laughs) this is good for the transformation of society, not just the transformation of your classroom or something. This isn't going to like teach how to flip right. your classroom and put it online, but it is going to teach how to <laughs> flip the world over and put it on communism. I don't know. I can't do anything with that. But <laughs> uh, flip your crap. Flip your classroom is my favorite uh, TLC. <laughs> flip your cl- Yeah, exactly. Ty Bennington comes and moves the bus and then your classroom. It's upside down. <laughs> yeah, the property brothers are there uh, teaching uh, science. All day. Hey, how wild is it that I knew what Ty Bennington's name was? That's crazy. <laughs> Bennington is impressive. Is, Ty, I could maybe get, but the last name never. Is his real name is. Ty Bennington, though? No, I have to check. <laughs> it is now. It is to our our thousands of listeners. Um. Oh no, his name's Ty Pennington, not Bennington. <laughs> <laughs> I like Ty Bennington better, though. Yeah, I think so. I think Ty Bennington is his real name now. Ty Bennington, host of uh, Flip Your Class. Okay. Uh, here's the most important takeaway from this entire podcast. Ty Bennington's name, his real name, his born Christian name is Gary <laughs> Tiger Burton. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. Yeah. How, how is Tiger a real name? That is insane to me. That is too much. I love it. That's very good. Well, Gary, get at us. <laughs> Gary, come flip my classroom, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Jump into the outro. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're capable. I don't know. We'll see. <clears throat> Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. Um, if you like this podcast, then you are surely a Christian and a Marxist, or maybe just one or the other. Either is fine. Um, if you liked it, though, you can give us some money on Patreon, patreon.com slash the Magnificast. You can also follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. We got a secret Facebook group called the Magnificast Basement, and we have to approve you before you get in, but we probably will because I don't really check. So the CIA is probably there. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, the intro music is by Mario Armstrong. The outro music is by The Logical Spoon. We are a part of some really cool podcast networks that you must check out. It is mandatory. It is part of the pedagogy of this podcast that you go and check out um, Theology Corner and Critical Mediations. Um, Critical Mediations, you can also find my great essay about why propaganda is good. Um, and also some other very cool podcasts that you should go listen to. And uh, soon at Theology Corner, you can read my essay about uh, uh, Travis McMakin's book on Golvitzer, which we interviewed him about a while ago, but they're about to post them all quite soon. Oh, nice. It's a good book, and it's probably a good essay. I haven't read it, but I just imagine. Yeah, the essay, I mean, it's okay. The book is very (laughs) good, though. Yeah, it is, for sure. Okay, (laughs) see you next time. I don't want to get
Get up in church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no damn between us and our Lord.